morning after lunch. I'd like to continue our forum this afternoon, and our next speaker is Dr. Joseph Lee. Joe is the Associate Director of Clinical Assay Development at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. So Joe hails from Canada originally. He received his undergraduate degree in life sciences from Queen's University and matriculated to McGill, McGill excuse me, <laughs> University, where he received his doctorate from the Department of Biochemistry. At McGill, he studied the interplay between protein tyrosine, kinases, and phosphatases. Joe did his post Doc at the National Cancer Institute, where he worked on retrovirus mediated cell transformation. Joe moved on then to BioReliance, and he led the Development Services Molecular Biology Group, where he helped to establish assays in support of gene and cell therapy. Following a move to the greater Boston area, Joe worked with the Analytical Development Group at Shire to help oversee gene therapy projects. He is currently the Associate Director at Takeda Vaccines, where he oversees molecular biology projects in support of the clinical program. Thank you. Welcome, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm kind of glad that you guys had your lunch, and I'm kind of hoping that you'll get that post-lunch coma so that I can <laughs> sneak this one by you. All right. So, um, oops, sorry. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the, you know, the, the general trends, you know, the pillars of medicine. We start off with the small molecules and then we transition, you know, towards uh, gene and cell therapies. But as you evolve to the right, the level of characterizational ability, I made that word up, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, goes to the left in terms of it becomes so much more complex uh, as you're dealing with the gene and cell therapies because you're basically dealing with you know biological systems as opposed to small molecules or small therapeutics. So, and I apologize for this. Um, about half of my talk is going to be on the regs. So you know, now's your chance to step out and, you know, take, go to the restrooms. Um, when we're dealing with the cell therapies, uh, we really have to, you know, go over to the regulatory uh, outlook, and that's 21 CFR 1271, which really describes human cell and tissue therapy, uh, tissue products, HCTPs. Uh, and for all intents and purposes, if it's Cellular tissue is made in humans and it's going to go into humans. It's, it's an HCTP. All right. And then the FDA has, you know, had a, you know, the, a high and low t tier groups in terms of uh, risk based approaches in, in their regulatory. And the lower tier groups really applies to 361 cells, whereas the higher tier groups are the 351 cells. If you're dealing with cell therapies where you have some degree of manipulation, uh, iPS cells or regenerative medicine or cell therapies by CAR-Ts, you are definitely in the 351 category. All right, and so this basically uh, outlines where you are. Um, so basically, most of you guys are around here. If you get bored, you can always pull down some of these uh, guidance for industries uh, for the uh, gene and cell-based therapies. Uh, you could always Google, that's what I did, <laughs> you know, for FDA, you know, guidance for industry, gene, cell therapy, it's all there. Okay, so when we're talking about biological products, we're really talking about 21 CFR, uh, 200, 300, 600, so in the case of 600, this is really characterization, all right? So you have to characterize based on safety, purity, identity, and potency, all right? And everything that we're gonna be talking about is always gonna be highlighted in safety, purity, potency, identity, all right? Um, and then, uh, in order to help you, you know, go through this, 
Uh, you have the nice people at the uh, ICH, so the pharmacopoeias and the regulatory agencies, all got together and then harmonized uh, methodologies or guidance towards either stability, but I do uh, point you into the general direction of uh, the Q2's assay validation and the method validation. So this is, you know, I sort of adapted this from the FDA, uh, and this is one of their, you know, uh, favorite little uh, charts. <laughs> Uh, about characterization and GMP uh, practices, and it's all about phase appropriateness, in that uh, early phase studies uh, have different uh, considerations than to your pivotal phase studies. So um, in terms of product characterization and uh, getting your assays up to GMP or your processes to GMP, but I should note that safety is always, you know, uh, the critical parameter all the way through, you know, from your phase one all the way through your BLAs. All right. And then when you're talking about assay development strategies, uh, I'm sure that most of you are all sort of aware, uh, the earlier you get to assay development, the better you are. You get to assay development late in the game. Um, you can expect a lot of late nights not sleeping because you know uh, you do have all these deadlines and the businesses do not stop just because you don't have an assay up and running for them. So I do encourage you start very early or at least I encourage your bosses. Right. Okay, so when we're talking about gene therapy and gene and cell therapies, uh, there's really two general flavors. One is systemic gene therapies where you're putting a gene therapy vector into the bloodstream uh, and it's going to go to either a target organ or a target cell or a, you know, a gene therapy which is also thought as the ex vivo cell therapies or ex vivo gene therapies where uh, the cell now becomes your drug product. All right, so in either case, you can effectively bring it down to two things. One is delivery and the other is therapeutic, all right? And so delivery, you can have, you know, various methods. You can have virus-mediated delivery. You can have, you know, transfection-ready delivery or you can use, you know, that <coughs> gene gun thing. Um, it should inspire you how technically oriented I am. Uh, you know, and then uh, you could also have something new, uh, your, you know, genetically modified microorganisms, you know, also known as live biotherapeutics. So uh, there are multiple uh, means towards the, this whole gene and cell therapy, you know, programs. All right, so chemistry and manufacturing and controls, everything about this section is, you know, about the process of making you know, your gene and cell therapy. How do you, you know, make the product? It's all about characterizing and the safety testing, you know, and the quality testing, all right? In terms of uh, virus production, and this is, I'm talking strictly for the, you know, gene therapy derived uh, Lenti or AAV, you know, based systems. Uh, typically, you'll use one of two uh, systems. The 293s are, um, pretty favored for adenovirus and lentivirus um, and somewhat for AV. Whereas the SF9 based systems seem to be pretty popular, you know, for the AV crowd. Uh, you should note though that unlike the biologic based systems where they're making things in CHO cells or these stable cell lines, uh, when you're making virus uh, you're basing yourself on uh, a transient uh, system, so you don't make virus using uh, stable cell systems other than your, your scaffold itself. And so there is a lot of guidance uh, for, uh, you know, production of viral delivery. So this is, you need to be able to characterize, you know, from a historical manner all the way through to production. Um, you know, the vectors, the how did you derive it, how did you make it, and everything has to be, you know, very well documented. Also, you need to have your master cell banks, you know, already planned out and, and characterized. 
and, and go through the whole thing. Uh, in the case of SF9 cells, you do have things called BICs, which are baculovirus infected insect cells. These are quasi cell lines. Um, the, the, there's some difficulties or some issues with baculovirus that's sort of in that gray area because um, these are transient, but they're not really transient. So, because you've master banked, you know, this, you know, 50,000 vials of these BICs and uh, when you're using it. So it's going to last forever, but they're not really stable in the cell line. So there's a little bit of confusion there, All right? And then depending on what kind of system you're using, you know, you're compelled to, you know, perform platform specific uh, adventitious agent testing or adventitious virus testing. Uh, the human panel, which is actually very similar to the 1271 uh, donor virus panels where you have to test for, you know, this whole set of uh, a virus. And then if you're using an insect platform, they have, you know, very much an insect panel. And you're also, your raw, raw materials testing, uh, your cell lines, if you're growing in serum, you have to do 9 CFR, so all your bovine or all your porcine type of virus and adventitious agents. Okay, and then there's ancillary material. And so uh, ancillary materials um, are not supposed to be in the final product, but they are required to make your final product. And so uh, DNA plasmids to make your virus, you know, that you're transfecting in, so you have to make sure that it is, uh, you're testing for all your ancillary methods. And, you know, and so the USP has guidelines uh, or best practices uh, for you to take. Uh, there's also, you know, in your, some specifications related to your plasmid preparations and the amount of supercoin, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we get to CQA and, and CQAs are based on <clears throat> quality by design principles. So. Adoption of quality by design principles, you know, are, are meant to provide specification standards uh, to the product and to the process. And it's thought that, um, you know, abiding by these principles, you know, improves overall quality as well as, you know, mitigates risk down the road. Uh, so, You'll know that the CQAs, you know, the specifications that we're going to identify are essentially the same uh, that you see in the, you know, earlier panel of the 21 CFR 600. You know, we're talking about identity, purity, you know, and potency, safety. But we're also breaking it down because it's not just product, it's also process. So uh, the product is, you know, your DS or your DP, but also the process is, you know, do you have any residual material? Uh, so uh, these are all these components. Uh, a lot of them are either going to be product specific or for the, in the case of safety, you know, it would be uh, compendial. So you would always uh, take a look at your favorite copy of the U.S. Pharmacopeial, you know, compendial assays and then, you know, pick and choose. Right? And then your potency. Right? So that sort of concludes that part of the regs. We'll start going a little bit now on the technical. We're, when we're going to identity, uh, basically we're looking at vector ID, trans, transgene ID, you know, the capsid ID. Right? Uh, there are immunological methods that you can analyze. There are biophysical, physical chemical methods, or there's molecular biology, uh, nucleic acid testing. Um, and so uh, when we're looking at nucleic acid testing, or really we're dealing with qPCR, uh, this is the standard model, although it kind of looks like an AV uh, genome. Um, I put in LTR to try to sneak in that it's, for the most part, like a, you know, like a lentiviral genome. Um, if you close your eyes, you can kind of see it. So, um, 
But basically, and they're all analogous, right? You have your terminal ends, you have a you know, promoter transgene, um, maybe you have three prime regulators, and then you have your poly A signal. Uh, so that's your standard uh, you know, vector. Any of these uh, you can sort of use as your ID standard, but remember, you have two types of ID standards. One is when, it's, uh, when you're looking at in the pure forms uh, where you can distinguish in a batch of uh, a virus material, then of course you can ID or you can target these transgenes or, um, or the promoters. But if you're looking at it from a clinical standpoint, or from a cell-based assay when you're doing infectivity studies and you're going to target your transgene, but there's also an endogenous human you know, transgene, um, how do you distinguish between the two? So when you're planning these things out, you know, these are things that you really have to consider. So that's why a lot of people will, you know, will target uh, you know, these artificial um, markers like the WPRE or or uh, even the, uh, the promoter regions if it's CMV because you know that that's not endogenous. All right, when we're talking about retroviruses, it gets a little bit more complicated. The gamma retroviruses are relatively easy, the lentivirus a little bit more complex. Um, the key feature though from a safety perspective is the um, I, you know, is the advent of uh, incorporating in a three prime self inactivation uh, portion, the SYN vectors. So these are no longer uh, competent for replication, but it's also an incredibly uh, important safety feature uh, for, you know, for the retroviruses. Uh, the other part of safety that's incorporated into retroviral uh, production uh, is that you can now make retroviruses and AV for that matter uh, by allowing these accessory genes in trans or expressing it in trans so that it limits the recombination of making a replication competent uh, wild type virus. So when we're talking about purity, you have two types of purity, the process-related purity, so those are your standard, you know, lot release assays of residual DNA and protein, um, you know, whether there's helper virus or benzenase and, and stuff in there. And that's also, you have to deal with your product-specific impurities. So the capsids, whether they're empty or full in the case of AV, um, Aggregation of your material is incredibly important because that, uh, in gene therapy and cell therapy, um, that may play a role in immunogenicity, which we sort of saw in the very first talk is supposed to be bad. Uh, so uh, these are all you know components to think about. When we're talking about you know residual nucleic acids. Uh, if I take the AV scenario, it becomes kind of complicated because. Uh, this is what you're basically thinking your drug product is. And depending on the design of your AAV vector, you could actually have a small AAV vector, which should be, you know, typically AAV is about 4.6 kV single-stranded. If it's smaller than 4.6, let's say it fits uh, 2.5, then you have something called a suboptimal pack. Um, and then from there, uh, it allows the potential of putting in two small pieces, you know, in there. So you're sneaking in an additional piece of uh, DNA because it's a more stable variant uh, that way. But it's also because the in the case of AV, the I ITR is kind of like your little amusement park ticket to get in. Um, and so there's another scenario in which uh, in your plasmid vector, you can have, you know, a chunk of the ITR in the, you know, and the vector sequence, and that gets kind of packaged in. Or you can just get uh, packaging in of just any, you know, any residual amount of DNA. Or, and in the worst case scenario, you can have uh, something from 293s, you know, go in. And 293s, 
Um, for those who don't know how it was made, it was uh, they used the leftmost 10% uh, side of uh, adenovirus, so with E1A and E1B. These are two viral oncogenes, uh, and so uh, it helped establish that 293s do become transform transforming uh, because of E1A and E1B. So uh, you certainly don't want to bring in you know, oncogenic features into your gene therapy. So it sort of defeats the purpose of having gene therapy. Uh, there's also a second component of 293s, which is a T component, and that's a T antigen, and that's also uh, unhelpful, you know, to have. So, and then the final uh, process uh, impurity would be an empty capsid. Uh, so that's kind of in a purity scheme, right, because you, your gene therapy vector should be pure for gene therapy, but if you have empty vector, then that goes against that purity portion. So, and it's also, you know, a potential component towards immunogenicity. Right. So, in the molecular biology tools, the de facto standard is always going to be qPCR, um, but then now we're starting to see some of the newer technologies like the digital PCR and next-gen sequencing. Um, next-gen sequencing, of course, you have to be a little bit careful because of uh, patient information and compliance standards, and basically uh, it's a black box because, you know, you may find something that you were not expecting and then you have a lot of explaining to do. Right. So the additional methodologies, you know, are CGH, you know, Sanger and next-gen sequencing. Um, and then my favorite now lately has been nanostring technologies. These are really focused uh, microarray technologies. You can use these uh, for, uh, this has become kind of a big deal now uh, lately because of it can support clinical applications, but it also can support uh, process development applications. So uh, if in your production of viral vectors, um, nanostring technologies actually are able to um, give you a signature of whether or not your cells are healthy and producing a lot as well as it also allows you to see how much uh, material you're testing simultaneously. So um, it's a very powerful technology if, uh, if used in the proper context. All right. And then I guess uh, why most of you guys are here is the, you know, the potency you know, component. And the, the big thing is of gene and cell therapies is, is the idea that uh, previously, people had thought that uh, that infectivity was a measure of potency, and I'm telling you right now, the FDA does not recognize infectivity as as a measure of potency. But it is, you know, it is a requirement of you, you know of your standard of testing because uh, infectivity also plays a role of dosing, and so. You still have to have dosing or infectivity. You also have to have another uh, potency standard. And so the idea is, when I sort of mentioned earlier about the gene and cell therapies, or sorry, uh, of the phase appropriateness, um, the FDA does, uh, or the regulatory agencies, they do understand this. So, you know, roughly speaking, they're saying that phase one, uh, it's sufficient to have transgene expression. Phase two, you want to see transgene function. And then phase three, you want to see biological function. And so that's sort of that gradation or that evolution of your potency standards. And so uh, there's you know, there's a number of ways that you can, you know, you can test these out, um, you know, and so depending on what your gene therapy is really for, it's all going to be product specific. But there is that component that you still do need an infectivity assay. So, you know, we'll go quickly through what that infectivity assay typically is. Uh, infectivity assay is also, you know, seen as being strength 
uh, a component of a uh, strength. Most people use an infectious center assay, um, which basically you're using the ideas, uh, ideals of the tissue culture ID50, so the TCID50. Um, it's limiting dilutions. Uh, it depends on what kind of serial dilutions that you want to use. Uh, and then your endpoint analysis is either going to be a Reed Monk or a Spearman Carver. And I think most people will use the uh, Spearman Carver, right? Uh, this is sort of the same for AV or, or Lenti, and you can use uh, you know, either a plaque endpoint or a PCR endpoint or an ELISA endpoint. So you know, the endpoints are pretty much up to you to decide you know, what kind that you want to use. You know, and then finally, this is a probably, if you're going to get into the gene and cell therapies using viral vectors, this is going to be the number one thing that the regulatory agencies are going to expect from you is, do you have a replication competency assessment? Because this is, number one, the, the biggest safety concern that they're going to, you know, that the regulatory agencies are going to be, you know, looking at is replication competency, and especially for the uh, retroviral and antiviral based systems. Uh, essentially, uh, most of these systems are going to be three rounds of replication where you infect or transduce cells, you collect the media, you know, you, you take that media and then infect or transduce into a second batch of cells, you know, let it grow, and then you bring it into a third batch of cells. And so it's sort of that serial um, assessment. And then if you still see either an increase or a sustained amount of uh, material, um, you may have an issue with replication competency. All right. All right. And then we're dealing with the one last part of the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, approaches, which is the uh, off-target effects, specifically for genome editing, CRISPR-Cas9, you know, lentiviral or retroviral systems, where you have integration. You are going to have to test for off-target effects, and so you can either use CellX technologies or chip, you know, chip seq or targeted sequencing. So there's all of these uh, components that you need to look into. Uh, of course, because you're looking at limited cells, there are a lot of special considerations that um, you know that cell therapeutics uh, you know have that's not the same as the regular therapeutics because this is personalized medicines. Uh, so you are very limited to how much uh, material that you have. You cannot be, um, a, or it's not reasonable for you to be testing, you know, a myco test and all these other adventitious agents agent testing, so uh, that's all part of the consideration. Which are, by the way, these are autologous, so, or typically autologous, so um, they're under slightly different um, testing strategies, all right? And then, uh, you know, further, you know, you're dealing with stem cell products or you're dealing with shelf life issues and, and so forth, so these are all uh, considerations for you to make, okay? and. That's pretty much it. I was on time? Holy wow. cow. Right on time. There you go. All right.